Hey there, this is Ari. Welcome back to the Energy Blueprint Podcast. With me now is Dr. Anna Kabeka, uh, who is a doctor of osteopathy. She is a best-selling author of The Hormone Fix and Keto Green 16. Dr. Anna is triple board certified and a fellow of gynecology and obstetrics, integrative medicine and anti-aging and regenerative medicine. If the first two weren't impressive enough, <laughs> uh, she holds special certifications in functional medicine, sexual health, and bioidentical hormone replacement therapy. She lectures frequently on these topics throughout the world to large audiences and is known nationally as the Girlfriend Doctor and is host of the Girlfriend Doctor show. She has personally developed natural products to help women balance hormones and, th and thrive through menopause, including the highly acclaimed Jolva Cream for the vulva and Mighty Maca. And we're gonna talk about both of those, plus a superfood blend. She now lives in Dallas with her daughters, horses, and dogs. So welcome to the show. This has been a long time in the making. Uh, I think we've been chasing after each other for a long time, and I think I'm probably part, mostly responsible for that. Um, so oh, it's great I'm, to, I'm, to be here with you. Are yeah, you really? I've been looking forward to it. Yeah, me too. So give you know I've I've had quite a few hormone experts on the show. In in fact, uh, just a few weeks ago, I had uh, Dr. Sean Tassoni uh, for the second time, I believe, on the show. I've had. Um, Dr. Christian Northrup, I've had Dr. Mesh Seibel, and I've had a few other female hormone experts. I, I think probably all of these people you at least know of, if not, you know, you're- Absolutely, friends, but, highly admire, uh, yeah. Yeah, and uh, Mar uh, Marisa Snyder, Dr. Oh, Stephanie Estima, right? So we've talked a lot about women's hormones. Um, I'm curious what your take on like on a big picture level, what is your take on female hormones and what do you feel sets you apart or where do you feel that your views on things differ or where is your unique specialty? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. I think like I also think about what like after hearing these amazing speakers and I know a lot of their platforms is where, you know, what other questions come up, right? And that's what I was thinking of while you were saying, how, I can, how, how can I best serve your audience? And so something that really struck out to me is, is the patients who've had hysterectomy, women who have had hysterectomies, for instance, women, and, and women in the perimenopause. Am I menopausal? Am I not menopausal? Doctor says I'm too young, yet I'm having all these symptoms. I feel like I'm going crazy. What's going on today? You know, <laughs> I don't know. That was, that was me. But anyway, um, you know, th these are, these are really big issues. And I, I think what, um, um, makes my approach unique is probably my journey is being diagnosed with early menopause at age 39 and, oh. you know, early menopause, irreversible infertility. I failed the highest doses of injectable fertility meds. And I was told the only way I was going to have another baby would be egg donation. And, and that wasn't an option for me at the time. And I was devastated upon devastation. And anyone who's gone through infertility knows that you're devastated each time that period comes or the negative pregnancy test comes up. And, and it's a tear, you know, it, it, there's so much that goes into this, right? There's so much that goes into this. And, um, and, you know, the fact that, you know, I struggled with obesity, I have diabetes on both sides of my family. I, I, you know, I struggled with these issues, probably, you know, since I was, uh, you know, a, a, um, a kid, right? And so the infertility, the early menopause, and then being a surgeon, being trained at one of the best institutions in the world at Emory University, working at Grady Hospital in Atlanta, and of course the Ivory Tower Emory University Hospitals, and um, having my doctor bag be empty. And as a result of what I learned through my own mess, my own trauma, that I wish no other physician this journey, to learn what I've learned. I, I went from doing to, you know, treating patients surgically as, as I well know how two to three surgeries per week to empowering women over their own body to heal their bodies and doing only two to three surgeries or needing to do only two to three major surgeries per year. And I reversed my infertile, I say with the hand of God, right? With the help of God, with his good grace, I um, reversed the reversed early menopause and naturally conceived and delivered a baby girl at 41 years old. 
Wow. So, awesome. So there's hope, right? There's hope, there's empowerment, there's natural ways that we can, you know, combat the, um, the, the misinformation and the, and the reliance on pharma and surgery as a first line. And so I think that's where I really have dug in to understand the underlying, underlying conditions and, and through my own journey, help other women who have, who have, I will keep them from suffering like I did for sure. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So in terms of hormones, um, I, I, from talking to a wide variety of, of different speakers and, you know, studying the subject myself for many, many years, I've seen that certain experts have sort of different takes on um, what hormonal imbalances or deficiencies or excesses women are actually suffering from. And I've seen uh, a number of experts really heavily focused on estrogen dominance, deficiencies in, in progesterone, uh, and some, uh, like Dr. Tassone, uh, focused on uh, oftentimes, not that he neglects the other stuff, but testosterone deficiency he mentions very commonly, whereas a lot of experts almost never talk about that. Um, what, what is your take on what a lot of middle-aged or older women, or even younger women, however you want to answer this question, um, what are the, the specific types of hormonal imbalances that, that you're finding women are suffering from? And the truth is, if we really want to get down to hormonal imbalance, we're going to address, and I would say, I, I went, you know, I studied in the best institution, I'm triple boarded, and I really studied hormones. I can tell you hormonal pathways, mechanisms of action, all that stuff, especially when it, com when it comes to the reproductive hormones, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, DHEA, man, I love them all, Ari, I'm telling you, I just love them. And, but the truth is, the major hormones are insulin cortisol, and the most powerful hormone in our body is oxytocin. So when it comes to balancing our hormones, we, I focus on those three now, because as I get to the underlying, underlying issues, as I kept digging, right, as I kept patching hormones, supplementing with hormones, and I, I'm a big believer in bioidentical hormones, as I kept you know, supplementing and, and looking. And I went through my own journey until I got insulin and cortisol under control and empowered oxytocin. I start my day off with oxytocin increasing practices. I want to end my night with oxytocin increasing practices. I want to pepper my whole day with improving oxytocin, the hormone of love, bonding, connection, gratitude, joy, peace, you know, love and granola. I don't know. You know, I mean, that is oxytocin. That's, 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 that's my most powerful. That's my, my weakness, by the way. You mentioned it right there, which is granola. granola? <laughs> yes. yes, I am a granola fiend. If oh my gosh, you got some keto granola recipe? Uh, no, I don't. But I, you know, if my, my wife makes some healthy ingredient homemade granola, it's quite difficult for me to control myself. I have great willpower with everything except granola. Yeah, um, yeah that sounds good. So you mentioned the oxytocin. That is a very uncommon thing. For people to talk about. So let's talk about what, first of all, on a, on a mechanism level, how is oxytocin tying in with some of those other female hormones? And then from there, I'd like to go into uh, some of the practical strategies, which you were kind of alluding to there. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, oxytocin ties in, in, in one of the most powerful ways. Like, so when we think of, um, I like to give this analogy Ari, one of the things is like, if we look at all our hormones in our body, my first book is the hormone fix. And I say, it takes more than hormones to fix our hormones, right? It's just like, uh, you know, diets don't work because it's not just about what we eat, right? It's when we eat, who we're eating with, right? All of these pieces of the puzzle. And I'll get to that, but I like to look at hormones like a university setting or a school setting. So look at our hormones, all of them, estrogen, progesterone, all like we have, you know, over a hundred different types of estrogens, right? Or close to. And so um, if we look at that and we think all our hormones are like stu the student body, we would consider the professors to be insulin and cortisol. I mean, they're going to, you've had good professors and they keep law order, you know, you're going to show up to class, you're going to do your, you know, with good professors, you show up, you do your best, you, you interact, right? You participate, all of that good stuff, there's interaction. 
And then the dean of the university or the school principal of the school would be oxytocin. So this, like, that's kind of when we look at it, each, each of us, each, each student, each hormone has its own talents, its own gifting, its own roles and responsibilities. And there's direction that, you know, needs to take place. And then an overarching benevolent, good leadership that's kind and fair and, and that's oxytocin. So when we look at that kind of interaction, that's the best way I can, um, I've found to illustrate it. Okay. So what I want to talk about insulin and, and we can talk about cortisol as well, but as far as oxytocin, how is it interacting specifically with, let's say estrogen or progesterone or testosterone? What's, what's the link there? So it comes through, a majority of that comes through the interaction with cortisol and progesterone as the mother hormone. So we look at um, a couple areas here. So when we, so we look at our hormonal cascade and progesterone being the mother hormone, right? Like derived from cholesterol, we've got progesterone and pregnenolone up top. And then downstream, when we're stressed, we're making cortisol. So we're leading into like, we're pushing cortisol and otherwise we're making D, supporting DHEA or a key adrenal hormone made by our adrenal glands in men and women, the ovaries in women and testes in men, DHEA. And then downstream from there, we have estrogen and testosterone. So when we're stressed, the last thing our body's diverting to are reproductive hormones. So for women, our periods are irregular. We have less sex drive. Um, and uh, less receptivity too. So it's less estrogen, testosterone, and DHEA. So when cortisol goes up, like that stress hormone, oxytocin goes down. And when cortisol is up for a longer time period, the paraventricular nucleus in the brain is suppressed, then says, okay, cortisol, you are frying us out. You're the you know, life-saving hormone, but you've been too much for too long. And now you're frying out my nervous system, depleting all of our other hormones. And so I'm shutting you down. And so when cortisol is shut down, oxytocin is shut down at the same. So when it's shut down at the same time because of the paraventricular nucleus of the brain. So you get this very intricate state of low cortisol and low oxytocin. And that I always say is the physiology of burnout. It's the physiology of divorce. It's the physiology of isolation, depression. That physiology is, is from there. And oxytocin, for oxytocin to function well, Again, oxytocin, like if you also look at it this way, cortisol and acidifying hormone, you know, break, will rob Peter to break, you know, to um, pay Paul, so to speak, it's a catabolic hormone, it breaks us down. And oxytocin builds us up, it's a more alkalinizing hormone too. And all our hormones, especially progesterone and the function of oxytocin are also vitamin D dependent. Mm -hmm. So for the receptor site, so having healthy vitamin D on board is another key, um, inter, you know, interlinkage, so to speak, between oxytocin and, and, um, and our other hormones. Got it. So okay. That so that is the counteract the, uh, the cascade of cortisol is to keep that in balance and to keep our body in the, um, in that more of a, uh, like say optimistic state, the positive state. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I have, I'm like reeling with questions here. So I'm, I might take this in a bit of a digression. If we can geek out here for a moment. Um, first, can I ask a simple question? Is oxytocin possible to test for? Does anybody run a test for that? Yes, through fresh frozen plasma. That's one way to test for it. Okay. So, um, and it's hard to test. Uh, you know, I've been doing, working with oxytocin since, you know, gosh, going on 20 years now. And I think we have still have yet to be able to test. And this is what I say with all hormones, while we can test them, they are energetic molecules. And until we can test them energetically, we're really just getting an idea. So it's good to look at saliva, blood, urine, all different ways. With oxytocin, we look at rapid testing. The other way that I've done it, I've done it, I've tested for oxytocin through a questionnaire. So my oxytocin quiz, and I've um, injected 10 units of 
oxytocin, mix it with lidocaine because you're, okay, so for our audience, oxytocin, this hormone of love, bond, and connection also may have interacted with it as a drug, as pitocin in labor, we're given pitocin. That mm. is oxytocin. And mm. oxytocin is, is designed to be in abundance at the time we deliver this baby. So it's naturally imprinting hormone. So we get this little cute, maybe ugly looking, wrinkled, beautiful baby in our hands. And we're like, oh my God, this is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in the entire world. And, and, you know, you just went through maybe maybe like me three days of labor and you're like, oh, I can't wait to do this again. Like, what are you thinking? Right. That (laughs) is the, (laughs) that is the, um, that is the power of, of oxytocin. It has that amnestic effect. It has the analgesic effect. So pain relieving effect. And it certainly is that imprinting effect. And, um, that bonding effect. And so that's why that natural, that natural childbirth and breastfeeding really helps our, you know, helps bonding and helps babies grow up to have good, healthy attachment styles too. We know when that's absent, that there's, there's an issue. And also the too much oxytocin or artificial pitocin, you know, um, injected oxytocin in labor can have consequences too. So this pitocin, I would inject 10 units intramuscularly and look for a reaction. So I'll give you a couple examples. So one is um, I had a, a, you know, I use oxytocin in my patients and in my medical practice, which I've since retired, but to use for PTSD, which I used it for myself in that and um, studied all the science behind it. And that also used it for sexual function to help with orgasm and receptivity at the time of intercourse for women and as well as men, but predominantly women. And, um, and then using it in, in my patients with burnout. And so I had, was treating one patient undergoing a very difficult, you know, very difficult challenges, struggling with depression, and certainly um, some added in uh, sexual function complaints. So I was using, uh, treating her with oxytocin. And we'd had these conversations about it and all the, my research behind it. And, and so she came in, scheduled an appointment for her 22 year old son. I'm like, okay you know, I will say it takes a strong man to come to a gynecologist. And so this 22 year old came in and um, slightly, you know, definitely like she said, he's been, he's, he's was a football player. He'd had, you know, multiple traumatic brain injuries and just is not himself. Like it's just does, has no motivation, no ambition. She goes, I slipped him an oxytocin. One of my oxytocin, okay, don't do this. Y'all don't share meds. Right. And she goes, and it just, it just affected him. And, um, I wanted to see if this, if you could help him. And so I injected him and he was, would not look at me in my almost, you know, Asperger's, right. Not autistic, but almost Asperger's and did not look at me in my eyes, very pale skin, cold, clammy handshake. And those are, those are some signs of oxytocin insufficiency. Okay. Um, I, you know, uh, preferring isolation, not socially, um, interactive at all. And so I injected him with oxytocin and when I looked for the signs, right. And all of a sudden he's looking in my eyes, he's smiling, his, you know, his ears pink up around his ears, pink up little flesh on his, on his chest. I'm like, okay, he's responsive to oxytocin. So he has definite oxytocin insufficiency and it's really interesting. So with everything else that we want to do to increase oxytocin and manage cortisol, and especially with traumatic brain injury, oxytocin is a piece of that puzzle. And that was really beautiful to see how that, that shifted him. Then he, you know, he went out and got a job, went out and got a girlfriend. I mean, his life changed as, as a result of this. And, and another patient that I worked with, a 52 year old, uh, ER physician, and you can imagine the stress that she's been under. And certainly like she had a, um, a very low score on the oxytocin quiz. So signaling oxytocin insufficiency also injecting because the blood tests are, you know, I mean, it's hard to do those blood tests, maybe easier now, but certainly when I was in practice, it was a little difficult. So injected uh, 10 IUs of oxytocin intramuscularly, you know, again, I use lidocaine because that burns. So we don't want to just do that by itself. And, um, and immediately like smile, sits back, relax, 
feels good. I'm like, okay, then I can prescribe her and we can use a prescription oxytocin again as a bridge while you're working on stress management, all these oxytocin building activities. And so those are, those are some ways to supplement with oxytocin and diagnose a deficiency. And if they hadn't responded like that, you know, oxytocin supplementation wouldn't, wouldn't be my first line of therapy. Very, very interesting stuff. And I have to say in all my years of reading books and, and interviewing people and studying health, I've actually never heard someone uh, talk about uh, diagnosing and treating oxytocin deficiency in that way. So very, very novel, good stuff. Um, it is quick. good stuff. And I will say one more thing, because yeah. this is such a powerful area. And another client that I had the privilege of working with was a, a family and they had 11 year old daughter who was on spectrum. And, you know, any, again, with all of this, like you said, what's our first way to treat or address, I will say, treat the gut microbiome, treat the gut microbiome, right? Enhance mitochondrial function, treat the gut microbiome, and you're going to improve everything, right? So it, hormonally, and that's a, p a big piece of it. So as I was working with her, this 11 year old's gut microbiome, we also, we also worked with oxytocin increasing behaviors, cutting out all exogenous hormones like from dairy and, and you know, really cleaning up her, her diet, gluten-free, addressing the gut microbiome, adding in um, very short term, uh, five days a week for school, oxytocin, and, um, and only for three months. And as that gave her just that leg up for healing, um, you know, I mean, she, she graduated at the top of her class. She's now in college. So it was really beautiful to see that shift, but also that social interaction, social behavior, social connection that, mm -hmm. um, again, it's not never a pill, a potion, a product, right? It's always a combination effect. But I think that there's a lot of need for that, that gut, gut cleanup and naturally empowering oxytocin through lifestyle. Yeah. I, I want to uh, get more into practical strategies in a minute, but maybe we'll we'll dive into mechanisms a bit more. You mentioned cortisol. You mentioned the paraventricular nucleus. Um, I, I, I want to bring in another little angle here, which is um, I spent about a year of my life digging into the literature specifically on um, different fatigue syndromes and burnout and stress-related exhaustion disorder. Uh, basically stress-related fatigue and chronic fatigue syndrome in relationship to cortisol and HPA axis function. And what's interesting and surprising and counterintuitive about the vast majority of that research is it actually doesn't link um, low cortisol levels to those conditions. There's a small amount of those studies, a minority that links slightly lower levels, another minority uh, that, that links slightly higher levels of cortisol, but the vast majority of the studies show actually no difference in cortisol levels between um, people with those syndromes and normal healthy people. Have you found, uh, I, I would say overall, the overall body of evidence on, on different kinds of stressors, whether we're talking about psychological stressors, relationship, financial stressors, um, career, you know, job stress, or um, even physical overtraining syndromes from doing too much exercise, the vast majority of that literature actually links higher levels of cortisol with, um, for example, overtraining syndrome or people suffering consequences of, of severe stress state. Um, on average, of course, this is generalizing and there's a subset of people that do have lower than, than normal cortisol. Uh, but do, do you think there's also a mechanism for high levels of cortisol to interfere with hormone functionality, uh, whether we're talking about female hormones or oxytocin or anything else? Absolutely. I think that's that chronic um, spikes, right? That chronic push. It's like putting your foot on the gas and the brake at the same time, mm -hmm. right? That's what I see in those states. It's almost like the gas and the brake at the same time. How does that look and how does it affect our circadian cycle? When is that cortisol then again, coming right back up at three, 4 a.m. in the morning when our body's been you know, rested enough and then we get those spikes in cortisol. So depending, you know, it's interesting to, to, hear, to hear that and to see that and considering what's, what's normal, what's optimal and when are those averages being taken 24 hour urinary cortisol versus what's the, what's the, um, 
pulsatile throughout the day. And I'm, I'm interested in, in that as well. When cortisol goes up though, you know, you're going to get that suppression of oxytocin. When cortisol goes up, estrogen and testosterone, DHEA are going to be depleted. And so testosterone being anabolic, DHEA being, you know, a pro-hormone and the precursor, you know, upstream from testosterone and estrogen. And I think especially in you know, the male versus female physiology. I mean, men have 10 times as much testosterone as women. So these like, you know, these um, chronic stress conditions, right? These um, are going to affect women in, um, women are more vulnerable to than men. And in fact, especially as we get into this hormonal shift between age 35 and 55, we enter this period for, you know, of neuroendocrine vulnerability. So we have the irregular cycles, the irregular bleeding, right? Often consider that an interruption of the function of progesterone. And so, um, and, you know, for some it's estrogen dominance, for others, progesterone insufficiency. I think it's, you know, chicken or the egg, right? Mm -hmm. and, um, and so you're getting into this state. So what happens is, well, with like, when you're depleting your, when you have a lot of cortisol and you're in this state of neuroendocrine vulnerability, you add all the downstream consequences of either, you know, chronically elevated cortisol or that, that, you know, that combination of foot on the gas pedal, foot on the brake. So the paraventricular nucleus shutting down, trying to shut down, right? That production of cortisol. So you don't fry out your nervous system. The cortisol is the key. Like I spoke with Dr. Fasano and I love this analogy. It's like the key that unlocks the gate to those membranes, right? So you get the leaky membrane, whether it's leaky gut, leaky heart causing atherosclerosis, leaky, you know, nervous system or brain, so to speak, causing Alzheimer's and dementia. Like that's that, that's that cortisol, that's that acidic catabolic function of that. Mm -hmm. And so when we look at that with the, um, you know, we, in women, 35 to 55, we have those changes and we're, our progesterone, this mother hormone to cortisol, to estrogen and testosterone is, is, declining rapidly. So beyond the GYN symptoms, the other symptoms that are bringing our patients in to see us are the anxiety, the PMS, the irritability, the mood swings, the loss of sex drive, the difficulty sleeping, the crashing fatigue, the waking, all of those as a function of this neuroendocrine vulnerability. And it, it can start early with our menstrual cycles and our, our again, a mood change, not just hormonal, but the nervous system, right? These are neurologic symptoms. And that's what really fascinated me in my research in, in solving, you know, getting to the underlying reasons why this, um, you know, why this is happening. So, and during, during this time period, 35 to 55, especially with this change in, in, in hormones. And again, you know, uh, men don't have that rapid transition, but women do. And so dietarily, nutritionally, lifestyle, we have to approach it in a different way. And now I forgot what question you would ask me to begin with. I went on a tangent. <laughs> no, that was, that was excellent. I was asking you about the relationship of cortisol to, to oxytocin, but let's, let's jump to insulin now, because I know that's, that's a big one. That's a big part of what you do. I love the analogy that you gave of kind of looking at some of these hormonal players as the professors of the student body to kind of help listeners differentiate between, you know, the, just understand that not all of these, you know, sort of dozens of different hormones are, are equal players in the results you get, but some are kind of bossing around the others. Um, so from your perspective, what, what is insulin doing? in relationship to a lot of these different female hormones and, and what, what problems do most people have with insulin? Well, I think one of the things is that as, as we age, our reproductive hormones naturally decline, right? And it's important to dial those in and support them as naturally as possible. Insulin, however, increases as we age and as we become, we become more insulin resistant as we age. And so insulin and progesterone have also this love hate relationship, uh, you know, I'm not exactly sure how that works, but definitely as, as we start getting declining levels of progesterone and estrogen, we do also become more insulin resistant. And what's happening during this time period 
is uh, what patients come in and explain and have symptoms of memory loss, right? Brain fog, more mood swings, right? And that weight gain without doing anything different. And that was my story when I turned 48, like I reversed early menopause and then 48 was spiraling down with brain fog, memory loss. And I, you know, a really amazing memory, you know, uh, to make it through med and, and work and do all those things at the same time. And that brain fog was really disturbing. And as well as I would say, as a, a single mom raising kids, my ex-husband had had a traumatic brain injury and you can't afford to have a, a brain fog and memory lapses when you've got teenage girls at home, they will take advantage of you. So, <laughs> so that is one thing. And, and worse than that was that weight gain without doing anything different. And at one point in my life, I was well over 240 pounds and lost that weight and was able to keep it off for over a decade. But that time shifted. And it really was when my patients would come in and, and tell me this, they would say, Dr. Anna, I'm gaining five, 10, 20 pounds without doing anything different. Right. And so I'm like, I was like, really, you're not in my head. I would never say that in person. I was like, really, you're not. Well, and I would do all the thyroid workup, dial in the hormones, lo and behold, you know. Um, and when that happened to me, I was like, well, like, seriously, not doing anything different. Well, here I was becoming more and more insulin resistant. And what happens as we hit this period of neuroendocrine vulnerability, our brain requires estrogen at some point, most likely progesterone as the precursor, but we know that gluconeogenesis in the brain, our brain is going to preferentially use glucose for fuel in abundance. We're going to use glucose for fuel quick and easy. And when that's not available, we're going to go into using our ketone bodies. The use of ketone bodies is not hormone dependent. So as I, you know, wanted to fight, predominantly wanted to fight that weight gain without doing anything different. Anyone knows who's lost a significant amount of weight and you start gaining it back without doing anything different. You're like, oh my God, I'll be 300 pounds before this stops. And so go, and that's when I really started a ketogenic diet. I have a, my um, uh, oldest child had seizures. So I was very familiar with it. And I used it in my neurologic patients and, you know, modified forms of it in my Canada patients. And so I just went strict keto, but I felt crazy. I felt cranky. I felt irritable. And I, and I needed to understand why, but as I shifted to go into ketosis and then understand that for women, especially in the perimenopause menopause, we don't have a lot of steroids on board. Like men, we don't have a lot of testosterone and because our progesterone and add in a good, healthy doses of stress or post-traumatic stress and your body's, you know, diverting spare resources to make life-saving cortisol, you're going to deplete those hormones even more. So that brain fog, that memory loss is really a big issue. And now you're really in acidic state. I'm not talking about, you know, blood pH. I don't want to get into that. Urine pH changes and cortisol increases hydrogen ion secretion across the renal tubules. So we'll see an acidic urinary pH. You can have the best diet and be under so much stress that your urine pH is still acidic. And that's a big, that's a biomarker. That's a vital sign that we should biohack a lot more aggressively. Um, and so as I like got into the state of then realizing I was so acidic as acidic as urine pH paper strips red. I mean, just the, the bottom line acidic, that was an aha moment to me to add in the alkalinizing to the ketogenic, to the intermittent fasting, to the higher fat, you know, really cutting out aggressively all carbohydrates, adding in those key alkalinizers, getting that combination of alkalinity and ketosis it was like the light bulbs turned on. It was like being in a chapel and angel singing, I call it energized enlightenment to get into ketosis with an alkaline urine pH at the same time. And I, I'm talking about this because that brain fog lifted and, and it is that sense of that, you know, brain fog lifted yet I'm at peace in my body versus, okay, you know, I'm using it's when I'm feeling cranky and irritable and on edge. And why should it be different for women? And that's where I went researching and, and trying to dig in and understand um, more about that. There's so much that needs to be done, especially in the perimenopausal women. That's why there are many different you know, clinical opinions, but that combination, it is, um, it's really empowering. So that 
regaining that insulin sensitivity through cutting out carbs, intermittent fasting, stopping snacking, which women over 40 do not need to be doing. And, you know, uh, with rare, rare, rarest exceptions, um, it's, you know, it's a powerful biohack. It's a powerful change to become more insulin sensitive and to modulate cortisol through monitoring your lifestyle um, practices, as well as, as, you know, adding in those good gut foods for the gut micro, those good alkalinizers and fiber to help feed that important um, bridge for hormone metabolism. And that's the gut bacteria. So that combination, becoming insulin sensitive and really empowering oxytocin over cortisol um, is beautiful. Very nice. So um, as far as insulin sensitivity is concerned, um, the, the main driver, as you know, is, uh, of, of insulin resistance is actually excess body fat. Do you feel that the, 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 key, the that particular dietary approach that you're talking about is effective as a result of primarily that it's driving weight loss or that it has unique additional mechanisms on its own accord, regardless of whether a woman loses excess body fat or not? Yeah, I think it's, it's in addition to that, right? In addition to that overpowering, because in, in doing my first book, The Hormone Fix, I, I went on to write Keto Green 16 and work, continue, I actually have it on now, my continuous glucose monitor you know, a CGM. So monitoring blood sugar, because I was checking, I have another book coming out. So I'm checking all my menu plans again, but for Keto Green 16, I want to make sure that I kept the blood sugar in a really stable way. And, and what I learned from this, Ari, was that when we are, um, especially in this neuroendocrine vulnerable time period, this, you know, or metabolically conservative or in survival mode, however we want to look at our body, you know, Amazonian survival, I could live in the Sahara for six months and still do really well. When we're, what I noticed is that um, through, you know, going to a meal plan, which is, you know, two, maybe two meals a day, or maybe two meals in a, a smoothie or three meals a day, but stopping snacking, increasing intermittent fasting, you move your hemoglobin A1C marker, your blood continuous blood sugar mark, you know, monitor of how well we're um, maintaining our, our glucose or glucose levels long-term, we, we see a really big shift in that. So it becomes this, um, the, a really big driver for insulin, increasing insulin sensitivity and lowering your hemoglobin A1C versus when we're snacking, I can't move the needle in my patients. They can lose weight, but I'm not going to move the needle like I can with intermittent fasting and stopping snacking. And as I saw with my own continuous glucose monitor, I mean, it, it does, even when you're eating healthy so-called snacks, you're still driving up your baseline glucose. So, but you know, so does, you can be fasting and be thinking stressful thoughts and your blood glucose is going to go up, right? Like I remember speaking on stage fasting for a conference and my, I was fasting and it was 10 AM and my blood glucose was up to 150 and like it's baseline at eighties. It was up to 150 for 30 minutes. Cause I get terrified to speak yeah. anyway. So that was fascinating to me. So I learned that just the power of our thoughts over our body. And that's where, you know, beyond what we eat comes into play with balancing our hormones and increasing insulin sensitivity. Very, very interesting. Well, this, I, I think is a, is a wonderful, like deep dive and map of how these different hormones relate to one another. And I love how you emphasize that, um, you know, hormones are not just hormonal abnormalities that are sort of occur for random reasons. There's a lot of people who are kind of under the, the, the misconception that, you know, oh, I have hormone abnormalities and the hormone abnormalities are the cause of my problems and who need to understand the link between, okay, well, what's causing those hormone abnormalities? How do we track that back to your nutrition and lifestyle and environmental you know, habits, environmental exposures. And uh, I love the way you created that map and emphasize, you know, the role of, of insulin and cortisol and oxytocin in 
affecting that. So what are you think, and, and you've mentioned a, a few of these already, but what do you think on a practical level are, you know, what, what's sort of the, the blueprint of the most effective habits and routines for someone to optimize their insulin, their cortisol, and their oxytocin? Yeah, thank you. Um, and I like that you put in here blueprint, right? Because you are the blueprint king. So <laughs> let's see for a blueprint for me, it's really creating, um, really creating the easy habits that work best for you that make you smile that bring you joy that give you satisfaction for the long run, right? Not just for the moment. And, and that's, that's where, um, you know, that's where I dug in, I say with number one is test don't guess know your baseline markers. There are four key hormone markers and very quickly, vitamin D 25 hydroxy, hemoglobin A1C, HSCRP and DHEAS. I think if we know nothing else and had money to only get the four key markers, I, I, I look at those because it tell, gives me pieces of each of those, those pictures from adrenal to cortisol to insulin. And I like to see that and inflammation, right? And um, so look at that and then check your pH and ketones because more effects are your pH. It's a biomarker, it's a vital sign. And it, you know, we can be vegan eating greens all day and you know, be in a stressful marriage, be in a stressful job, being watching the morning and evening nighttime news and you're gonna be acidic. So it doesn't matter you know, how much you're eating if your thoughts are based on fear and that's a dial. Like, am I, are my actions based on fear or based on love? And, and I look at that as a dial, you know, and if what I'm doing, how I'm thinking, is it fear-based thinking or love-based thinking? And how am I, you know, honoring myself and others in this process? So that perspective shifts your physiology in such a dynamic way that you do manage cortisol and empower oxytocin when you do that. So starting the day, and, and for me, like a day in my life looks like this and my clients online and my girlfriend, Dr. Club community and have done my magic menopause program. I read my books. No, like this is, this is kind of our process. Like I, before I even open my eyes in the morning, I'm great. I'm thinking, what am I grateful for? Where did I see love yesterday? Where was I loving? Where did I laugh? Where could I have laughed at myself more? You know, and just like, okay, how can I laugh at that now? Because laughter is incredibly good for oxytocin. Gratitude, thanks. Love, where you see love is increasing oxytocin. So starting off your day with that as a, a, a first step. Um, for me, having traumatic PTSD and you know, severe burnout and all of those things, that's been life-saving that rewires my brain, rewires my physiology from a negative downward spiral to a positive upward lift. So that's a, a critical practice that's as important as what I eat, the keto green diet plan and lifestyle plan that I follow. That first, you know, when we want to shift our behaviors, we have to shift our morning. And so that shift in the morning is probably the most powerful, powerful thing I and my clients do. Um, to get I want to, I want to interrupt you for, for one second and please bookmark your, your thoughts. So you don't lose, lose track of where you were heading. Um, I just read a fascinating study just a few hours ago, uh, in women, um, who were still, um, who were lactating, who were breastfeeding their, their, their children. And, um, they measured the effects of laughter on melatonin production, uh, which is obviously another hormone, another important hormone in sleep and brain health and Immunity. mitochondrial health, um, and many other things. Um, and they showed that compared to like, a, I think they used a serious movie versus, a, a, a comedy that invoked laughter. And they found that laughter doubled melatonin production before bed and doubled the, the measurable melatonin levels in the breast milk that was being fed to the babies. So to that, that point, uh, yeah, absolutely. How, how much that laughter component that most people wouldn't necessarily think is having a direct impact on hormones is now affecting melatonin and oxytocin, which is affecting sleep quality and so many other aspects of your, of your physiology. Just Anyway, just connected the dots between something that happened earlier today and what we're talking about. 
Oh my goodness. That makes me think because I've just started with my daughter watching the series. We watch an episode at, at, in the evening. I, we have no TV, but we've started this um, at Netflix. Oh, it's an old one. It's Gilmore Girls. Anyway, just cracks me up being a single mom and totally relating. I mean, just cracks me up every night. I've been sleeping better now than ever, according to my uh, bio strap, which I'm not wearing right now, but I've been sleeping with. But laughter, increasing melatonin. I hadn't made that connection. I love it. I think that's yeah. awesome. And, you yeah. know, decreasing cortisol for sure. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So uh, do you, do you want to pick up where you left off or I'm happy to jump in with a, with a question. I just want to make sure I'm not interrupting your flow. Yeah, no, that was basically the start of my day. And then keeping an intermittent fasting practice of 13 to 16 hours on a regular basis, sometimes longer, sometimes not. Mm -hmm. Um, is a key aspect and then breaking fast in a keto green way. That's a healthy ketogenic choices, healthy fats, healthy, high quality grass fed, free range protein, and, um, and lots of those good green alkalinizers. So nice. yeah. I, I wanted to come back to the urinary pH thing um, because that's a, it's a somewhat controversial topic in the sense that you know, there's sort of one group of people and, and there's certain books that have been popularized, I think maybe from the nineties or early two thousand, uh, around the idea that, you know, we can alkalize our bodies and out change our, our body's pH in really profound ways. And there's a lot of people kind of operating in that under that premise or belief system. And then there's a whole bunch of, you know, sort of quote unquote, evidence-based community who said, who poo-poos all that and says, um, you know, that's all a bunch of nonsense. You know, our body maintains this precise range of pH, you know, regardless of what you do and you can't affect that no matter how much you try and alkalizing your body is a bunch of nonsense. Um, but what's interesting and uh, usually unknown to most of those um, sort of evidence-based trolls, as I, I would refer Skeptics, to them, right? yeah. Yeah, is, is that there actually is a body of literature around something called potential renal acid load, PRAL. And uh, it does show that, for example, eating more alkalinizing foods, uh, more greens, more fruits and vegetables, actually does change urinary pH. So even though the body is maintaining this sort of precise pH range in the blood and some of the other tissues, depending on what you eat, you're, you're straining those pH buffering systems to some degree. And there is a body of literature showing like um, higher potential renal acid load is linked with, you know, much greater in, uh, rates of diabetes and, and other health conditions. So there is this link, it's kind of this weird hidden link that's there because blood pH isn't changing that much, but there still is something to the pH story. Right. It, uh, there absolutely is. And so I found this interesting, but again, a little on my background is that before I went to med school, I was a bench scientist, so to speak, a researcher with the diving medicine department of the U.S. Navy, working with Navy divers, deep sea divers, dive tables, right? And very stressful conditions. And I did, I was ex exercise and respiratory physiology. So I lived in that pH balance. We monitored that pH balance. We looked at blood gases at, you know, 310 atmospheres, right? And, you know, where can we push the body and how do we recover the body? I mean, I, you know, I ran mass spectrometry, Ari. I mean, that was, that's a long time ago. We're going on 30 years now. Plus, when was that? 1988? <laughs> yeah. Okay, a long time ago. And, and, um, and CO2 plays a huge role in, in blood pH. We had CO2 scrubbers, right? For, mm -hmm. you know, we looked at that work and, um, and actually published on that in, in Amsterdam for the Royal Navy way back when I was 22 years old. So I love this stuff. I mean, I love this stuff. And so I, I would hear that. I'm like, what do you mean? It doesn't I mean stress affects your, I mean, we're going to rob Peter to pay Paul, right? We're going to, what's up, what's the urine pH said? It's not just about how we're nourishing our body, but it's the stresses, right? It's the CO2 burden. It's, and what's interesting, because, you know, I, I, I'd been under this investigation since I started talking about it, um, you know, in, in 2014, 2015, about the importance of urinary pH. And um, 
And the reality is like, I, I went to the you know, research when we even talk about ketogenic diets, we look at the Inuit tribes in Alaska and, and many people have said, well, they're high fat diets and they don't have, you know, high heart disease or cancer or this stuff, but you know what they're doing. So I was like, well, where are they getting their alkalinized, their minerals to combat the acid load of a ketogenic diet? Well, they're eating bone broth. That's a staple, a daily fish bone broth. That's your minerals. And now what is the ketogenic diet community saying? They're saying, oh, take mineral salts, right? Your tri salts, your mineral salts. Your... I'm like, that. those are your alkalinizers. Those are your buffers. Those are your pH balancers to, again, to keep from being catabolic and why it took so long because more women had to come on board. Cause again, men have protective testosterone, 10 times as much testosterone and more circulating estrogen in the brain than a menopausal woman, by the way. So, because we're relying on our ovaries. So that's why we have to, and I, I, I don't think it's just a good idea to be in a, a, a intermittent fasting lifestyle, a healthy keto green type lifestyle in perimenopause and beyond, it's mandatory. It's mandatory for brain health. It's mandatory for mitochondrial health, cellular health. And I know you know more about the mitochondria than I ever will. But I'm looking forward to interview you on my show so you can enlighten me further with you know your brilliance. I'm looking forward to it. So I mean, but that's so powerful, right? We need to shift and men and women are different. And so understanding those differences and understanding the importance of alkalinizing. And that's why when I started using, and I encourage clients, just check your pH, get an alkaline urine pH, and it can take a long time, get an alkaline urine pH along with ketones, urine ketones, blood ketones, however you're measuring ketones, but I measure urine pH and ketones together. And when you get that combination, it feels so good. It feels so, so, so good. And so that's what I encourage. How do you feel? What's your end of one showing you, right? And the best science I have to support it is it's going to make a whole lot of difference. And, um, and it, it certainly shows you when you're on track and when you're off track and, you know, and, you know, client after client who, who do shift to prioritizing that alkaline urine pH um, and, and getting into ketosis at the same time periodically, at least they, you know, you tell you they are, they are raving fans. They are raving fans. Mm -hmm. And for me Beautiful. too, it gave me that clarity and that peace that, you know, in the Bible, it says the, you know, the, the peace, despite all under understanding, right. That being the eye of the storm or the ocean, not the waves. And that's that physiologic balance. That's very grounding that can help. And I also tell clients, if you're having trouble three days of camping in nature, that's, that's a quick way to an alkaline urine pH. So go figure. Mm -hmm. Very, very cool. Uh, Dr. Kobeka, I've really, really enjoyed this. This has been a, a lot of fun to geek out with you on all these hormonal pathways and what affects what um, really novels and interesting stuff. So thank you for that. Uh, I know you have a few products, interesting products. Um, I, was, I was joking with you before this that I'd love to give you a testimonial for your Jolva cream, but unfortunately, <laughs> I don't have a vagina to try it on. Um, but <laughs> tell us about uh, your Jolva cream and also the maca product. And you have one more product, the, uh, is the keto, keto, keto green, green protein cream. shake. Yes. Mm -hmm. So tell, tell, tell us all about it. Yeah. So I created products to help me on my journey, uh, you know, as I um, travel, you know, as I, I've had my own anyway, my own struggles, and there was nothing I could write on a prescription pad, essentially, or do with a surgical knife that was going to give me the results that I needed or wanted for my patients. And so that led me to, you mentioned Jolva, that led me to um, create my over-the-counter uh, Bulvar cream, Jolva. So just like Bulva with a J. And um and use that has a combination of ingredients that you know we benefit from as we get older. It includes plant stem cells from the Alpine rose, which is this rose that blossoms in the Swiss Alps amongst the harsh conditions of rocky terrain and icy, you know, inhospitable weather. And I'm like, okay, if that doesn't exemplify femininity, mm -hmm. I don't know what else does, especially as we age. And the stem cells have great science behind them, including antiviral properties, certainly the anti-wrinkle collagen building properties. So that's the Alpine rose stem cells. And then you know, I, I always, I always wondered about that because I've been seeing in the last year or two about these different plant stem cells that are being put in some of these anti-aging creams and things like that. And I honestly, I've never 
looked into it and never seen a study on it because I've never taken the time to delve into it. But I was wondering, is there any science on, on any yeah, of the plant stem cell stuff? Yes, there's really beautiful on the alpine rose plant stem cells. I studied many different ones before I decided on the alpine rose plant stem cells, but it, you know, because of the antiviral in the, you know, collagen building and these beautiful and just, just the essence of it, it's a really beautiful stem cell. So there's a lot of really good science behind it and, and cool. basic science. And then I added in DHEA which I used in my patients, prescribed for my patients, compounded for my patients, and then um, added DHEA. So that is one of our adrenal pro-hormones. And it's over the counter in the US. In Canada, it has to be by, by prescription. But um, I added that in as well as some coconut oil, shea butter, and just really a blended a trade secret proprietary blending formulation that really works to drive deep into the tissue. So you can use it externally, um, does not have to go in to the vagina to be absorbed really well and work. You can use it as a lubricant during intercourse. You can, you know, massage it in, I always tell clients a pea size amount, massage it in daily or wipe with it, clitoris to anus, keep all that tissue really healthy, you know, it, game changing results. You can read thousands and thousands of testimonials on my website about Jelva. So um, for helpful that accidental bladder leaks and I've had my athletes, Olympic athletes, even just really big, big, big fans and relying on Jolva as a natural option for them. So it's really beautiful. And then my breast cancer patients too, being able to give them something that turns back some of the changes that chemotherapy and radiation therapy cause in a very natural and healthy, again, a lot of good science on my website at dranna.com to help with that. My first formulation was my Mighty Maca um, greens product, my Mighty Maca superfood blend. And as a result of my journey, uh, my own healing journey that I took for a year around the world and in that, um, uh, you know, there's that, that Buddha saying, everywhere you go, there you are. I always say I went around the world to figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> but um, that where I, I experienced maca, the superfood healing um, power of maca and a, a root that grows in the Andes in Peru. It's native there. My maca is from Peru. And I've been using the same sustainable source for over a decade, almost close to 15 years now. And um, the science behind maca is beautiful to help with um, men with erectile function, stamina and energy, women with hot flashes, sexual function helps improve all areas of sexual function. And so I combined it with other superfoods that I experienced around the world, including resveratrol, turmeric, quercetin, cat's claw herb. And this formula has been around for over you know, getting close to 15 years. I have people on it for 15 years now. We have helps with fertility. I mean, it's pretty amazing formula and all my products are hundred percent money back guarantee. So if you don't like it, don't, you know, worry, we've got you covered and we have a great customer service. I'm here to help. And then my keto green, after I wrote um, the hormone fix and created my keto green plan, everyone wanted, um, you know, a chocolate flavored keto green shake. So I, I formulated that with some hormone balancing nuts and seed blends. And of course, all our bioavailable albion micronutrients and chelated minerals to make it a real meal replacement with zero grams of sugar. And that's really important in our, in our shakes and, you know, and especially again in, in menopause and, uh, and beyond, we become real sensitive to, to any, any sugar. So really eliminating that so that we have um, stable blood sugars, meaning strong willpower <laughs> then that keto green shake is there. And we've got a great um, offer for your audience. We put a package together of Mighty, Mighty Maca and Keto Green Shake at a huge discount for your audience. Oh, that, awesome. Yeah, and that's at dranna.com forward slash Ari. Beautiful, thank you for doing that. I didn't You're even welcome. ask you to do that, but thank you. I'm glad you did. <laughs> you are very welcome. But wonderful, and they get a, they get a discount. What, what did you say the, the details on that work? Yeah. It is, um, you can say 15%, so over $25 on the Keto Green Shake and the Mighty Maca. So. Perfect. Okay. And the website is Dr. Anna forward slash Ari? DrAnna.com forward slash A-R-I. Yep. Beautiful. -E awesome. awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Anna. Really, this was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed connecting with you. It was, it was worth the wait. And uh, I look forward to more conversations in the near future. Me too. Thanks for having me, Ari. Thanks.
Hey there, this is Ari again. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, if you found it valuable, please share it with your friends, share it with your family, help me get the word out there. Also, if you're on YouTube, make sure to hit the subscribe button and hit that little bell to get notifications every time we release a new video or new episode of the podcast. And if you're listening to this, make sure to subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or on your favorite podcast app. Thanks so much for supporting my work at the Energy Blueprint. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I will see you in the next one.